We have some time baked into both of our sessions today for Q&A, and that's something we're, we're very eager to get from you. Uh, we have an online audience this morning that we'd like to say hello to, and if anybody watching online has questions, they can submit those to our Twitter feed at Mises.org. Um, and we're also going to ask to join Tom DiLorenzo, or Father Larry Bean, uh, from the Salem Lutheran Church in Gretna, Louisiana. Um, he is a pastor of the very un-PC variety, and he has uh, written a lot on NewRockwell.com, not only on the subject of anarcho-capitalism, but also on uh, what's happening in some of the mainline Protestant churches that have gone off the rails. So we thought it would be interesting to get an un-PC member of the clergy when so many of them seem to be infected uh, to their core with, with PC thought. So we have... Uh, about 30 minutes or so for some questions. Uh, some of you have had these slips that you can send up to us. We're also going to have microphones circulating, so feel free to ask any and all questions that might come to you. The only note I would say is we're going to break for lunch after. Apparently, um, we have several, we have books by all three of our main speakers today that can be signed. However, if you'd like to get one signed, you need to purchase those apparently by 12.45. Um, so we'll take some questions now before we break for lunch. So let's start with this one. This is from Jay from Needville, Texas, a town I've heard of. Uh, it's for Dilo. It says, Tom, recently there appears to be specific attacks on Austrian economics as anti-Catholic. Keynesianism and socialism seem to get a free pass relative to the Austrians. Has this target been as elevated as a Je at a Jesuit university as it would seem in the Catholic press? That's quite a question. Well, I, I work at a Jesuit uni university, and uh, when I first got there, the old Jesuit who was a president, uh, his brother was a, a Fortune 500 CEO. He founded uh, the business school. He took me to lunch every time I had a Wall Street Journal article published. They very appreciative. Uh, but then, you know, fast forward 20 years, and the new guy is, is a cultural Marxist. He's, he's the kind of, uh, Brian Lenane, he's the kind of person that if he was, uh, in a, uh, alive in the Soviet Union under communism. He would be the guy going around pointing out the dissenters in the neighborhood for, for Stalin to round up and, and execute. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, well, yeah, so the, especially the Jesuits are especially uh, bad on, on this. Uh, uh, how many stories could I tell you? I, the, uh, John Allison, the, the, the former CEO of the BB&T Bank, called me up on the phone out of the blue one day. I never met John Allison. I knew who he was, but he called me up. And uh, he offered me $350,000 for a, an academic program on the moral foundations of capitalism. And uh, because he had read my book, How Capitalism Saves Ameri Saved America, and he said, I make all my top managers read it. And, uh, and he said, uh, he offered me the money for a seven-year grant uh, for, for lecture series and all academic programs. And, uh, and also, he said, I'd like to give uh, you enough copies of Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand for every school in the business school. And uh, the university president told me that's a, that's a, a deal killer. You know, if the, we, we can't give away the books to our students. And I said, why? And he said, uh, well, uh, Ayn Rand was an atheist. And I responded by saying, well, so was Karl Marx. And <laughs> you use the Communist Manifesto in a lot of classes here. And I asked him, have you, have you uh, polled the religious views of every single textbook author that is used at this university? Uh, no, it's just in the, so we went on and on like that. And, uh, but he never relented. They said, that's a deal killer. You cannot give away uh, copies of Atlas Shrugged. And it took them uh, about two months to give me permission to accept the money, the grant. And then once the grant was accepted, um, they ordered the public relations department to not issue a press release. This BB&T Bank was badgering me. They've got good PR. That's the reason they do these things uh, for community relations. And so we never got a press release. And uh, because they, they believe that capitalism is a sin. And uh, the practice, you know, the free market capitalism is a sin. And I'm not sure, I can't speak for all the Catholics. Tom Woods is our Catholic expert. Here he's written several great books on the Catholic Church, but the Jesuits, uh, at least the modern one, the modern day ones, the modern crop, they're very different from old Father Ridley, who I knew uh, when I first took this job, and uh, and they're they're really 
uh, Marxist ideologues hiding behind priest scholars. Uh, they, they really are. Uh, like the Pope, for example, and I'll say it. You know, I consider him, he's a Jesuit uh, from South America. And every year on my campus, uh, there's, there's never any celebration of St. Ignatius of Loyola uh, at this Jesuit school. The only kind of campus-wide, uh, not a celebration, but uh, I don't know, event is uh, every year they put crosses all over the campus to commemorate the, uh, the Jesuits who were murdered in El Salvador in the 80s because they were conspiring, apparently, with the, the communist revolutionaries to overthrow the fascist dictator uh, of the day down there. And uh, I always thought it was funny that there's never any memorial for anybody else on the ca campus because, well, they were fighting for the good cause. Uh, they died for the good cause is my interpretation of why that's the only memorial that's ever, event that's ever on the campus. So that's all I'll say for now. I don't want to take up all the time. But Father Bean, any, any comments on the Pope's uh, recent trek through the U.S.? Well, the, uh, the Jesuits uh, didn't used to be so radical. I mean, they, their early history, they were advocates of markets, and a lot of the roots of Austrian economics is uh, in the Salamanca School in Spain and so forth. So at some point they became radicalized, and, uh, and the current pope is a Jesuit, and he is promoting Marxist economics. But, you know, um, this is not Catholic doctrine. I'm a Lutheran pastor, but... Uh, you know, all of the all of the Christian denominations, including the Roman Catholic Church, have divisions within them. So, uh, just because a pope is advocating for Marxist economics, don't confuse that with Roman Catholic dogma. And you will find fellow Roman Catholics who are advocates of markets. And and just the same in uh, in my world, in the Lutheran world, you will find uh, uh, Lutherans who advocate for freedom. So don't be fooled by you know certain self appointed leaders. Uh, support the pastors and the bishops who uh, who advocate for liberty and who advocate for markets. They're out there, so hunt them down and uh, and support them. Write to them. You know, it's it, it can be kind of lonely. Uh, you know, especially if you're a pastor of a church, you're you're a bishop, and you, you know you're you're taking all this flack. But I'll tell you, getting getting support, emails from people, from Catholics, from people who are uh, who are supporting uh, markets. Please do do that. It really means a lot, and it and it, it I think it strengthens the clergy to know that you've got their back. We have, by the way, when I when I uh, asked the university administrators, my university, why uh, they couldn't issue a press release about this grant, uh, they said that they thought my book, How Capitalism Saved America, was against Catholic social teaching, and I was told that by a mathematician. Tim, Tim Snyder, the academic vice president, who all of a sudden became an expert in Catholic social teaching. And so I guess he's really a, uh, a cultural Marxist hiding behind a math degree from Princeton. On the, on the topic of social justice, this is a, a big, big buzzword among the PC and among in uh, religious circles, too. And I, before I forget, I have to put a plug in for this new book by Vox Day, uh, SJWs Always Lie. It's like a homework assignment. You all download it. It's like five bucks. <laughs> it's, it's really magnificent. It's from a world I'm not really familiar with, from science fiction writing and video gaming. I mean, that's not my thing, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the principles he lays down in this book, uh, not only diagnosing the problem, but showing how we can fight back against this stuff. It's absolutely brilliant. So uh, please do uh, make note of that. SJWs always lie. Social justice warriors. Vox Day, V O X D A Y. I think it's only available in ebook form, but it's five bucks. It's it doesn't take long to read it, and it's brilliant. Do we have an audience question? This gentleman here. Any comments on Gramsci and his description of the long march through Western institutions? Well, I, I, yeah, well, we haven't, can't mention everybody in a half hour, I guess. Uh, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian philosopher, yeah, he's known as another guru of the politically correct left. Uh, he's famous for this phrase, the long march through the institutions, take over the media, the universities, and so forth. And, and so, so these people are Gramsciites, I guess you could call them, and they've been successful there. I can, I can recall being at a Liberty Fund conference in 1990 
sitting next to Henry Manny, the late Henry Manny, and Milton Friedman, now they're the late Milton Friedman. And, uh, and Henry Manny said at that time, we've lost the universities. This is 1990. Hmm. And Henry was, you know, he's the founder of the law and economics movement in the, in the economics and law profession. He, he ran the Law and Economics Center at the University of Miami and at Emory for, uh, and at George Mason for years. So he was a very prestigious academic. But this was a long time ago, and he thought we'd already lost the uh, the universities. And so the, the Gramskyites uh, were successful already at that point. And, of course, the media is pretty much the same nowadays and a lot of other institutions. Uh, this is a good question from the audience, from Jason at the University of Florida. It says, how does Bernie Sanders relate to PC, especially when his supporters claim that he's being shunned? And we see this a lot of times the left says they're the, they're the victims of PC. Any comments on the Bernie Sanders revolution? Well, uh, Tom Woods, I think, is, is publishing or has published mm -hmm. a book called Bernie Sanders is Wrong About Everything. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Tom dis disappeared, but... Uh, but I know it was either in the works or it's already out. I don't know. It's a it's a free ebook. It's out. It's a free ebook. So go to tomwoods.com. You can probably download the free uh, ebook uh, by Tom. On, uh, and so yeah, they, that's that's maybe what maybe that's what they're talking about when they talk about poor Bernie. But he's he's didn't he raise twenty million dollars last quarter? Uh, so uh, he's not exactly being uh, discriminated against by anybody. He's the darling of the left. He's probably a little too far right wing for most most of the Jesuits at my school, my university. <laughs> but but they'll take what they can get. We have an audience question. This gentleman here. Out of uh, political correctness, I thought it was racist that you picked this question over mine. So <laughs> that was that was my own bias coming through the mic. Um. TJ DiLorenzo, you may have already answered this question. I was busy taking notes, so I may have missed it. But um, today's left wing, today's left wing prides itself on pushing the arts, museums, education, public libraries, etc., all in the name of helping the people. How much of the left wing's uh, involvement in these programs is really just a Trojan horse for cultural Marxism? Thank you. Well, I'm not really much of an expert on art museums and, and all that, but I. I've been noticing for a lot of years that a lot of it is, is politicized, uh, of course. Uh, uh, I, your question re uh, re makes me uh, remember uh, uh, being in San Francisco with my old friend Yuri Maltsev, who, uh, who worked for Mikhail Gorbachev as a young man and defected from the Soviet Union mm -hmm. before the collapse. And he became an Austrian economist. He's, he'd been, he's been working with the Mises and Sudov and for many years. But anyway, Yuri and I, went. they had a... Uh, a, a Russian art exhibit in San Francisco years ago that Yuri and I went to, and he was showing it all, all to me about how it was how art was used to to sort of indoctrinate and propagandize people in the Soviet Union, and and I have to say that I've seen a lot of similar similar art at, at uh, various museums here, but I've never done a study of that. I know uh, I think uh, Tyler Cowan, the the economist Tyler Cowan at George Mason University, has written a book on sort of culture and and uh, and economics. So uh, maybe I, I could recommend looking up what Tyler Cowan has written about it. He's he's the one person I can think of who's actually written a book on this on this question. Maybe uh, Larry has something to say about no, that. Well, I, I, the the cultural Marxism thing. It's it's just kind of funny you mentioned that. I was in Russia this summer, and uh, I've, I've made a couple trips there. We have some Lutherans in Russia, and um, a friend of mine is the rector of the seminary in Novosibirsk, Siberia, and he was saying what it was like to grow up in the Soviet Union, you know, math class, instead of, you know, Johnny has one apple and Mary has one apple, you know, this sort of thing. The questions were all tinged with uh, Marxist, everything had to do with Marxism. So when you were in math class, you know, you were learning about the, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, and that's, I mean, that's, it was all consuming. And I think, you know, if you do go to a museum, if you go anywhere, it's it's almost like it's it's in the air we breathe. The PC, even even when you don't think that it is, you know, the cereal boxes. I mean, wh wh why is it always like this? I think we have to start noticing this and start challenging it. And by the way, the, our friend Paul Cantor, C A N T O R, has written a, a couple of books on literature and political. You could call it literature and political correctness. You might look up Paul Cantor also. Gentleman here had a question. 
Yeah, so I had a question. I was talking to the pastor earlier, and he's at this table, about the Supreme Court decision regarding homosexuals and how it's going to affect churches and down the road as far as marriage and tax-exempt status and all this. You can elaborate on Well, Christianity is based on the premise that there is an objective truth. We can disagree about what that truth is, but Christianity is incompatible with any teaching that truth is malleable or relative. And so the Christian teaching that's been handed down is that we have a definition of what marriage is. And it's the same as really what pretty much all societies have said uh, marriage is. And so now by virtue of a, of a fiat decision of a, of a court, that's being turned on its head. So uh, just we were talking earlier about sort of practical matters. I mean, what, what I've decided to do as a clergyman and what my congregation has decided is that I'm not going to sign any more marriage licenses. I'm just out of the business of acting as an agent of the state on that. So, and, and it, it turns out that this is actually what civilized people all around the world do already. You know, people in Europe, people in Russia, you can have a church marriage, you can have a civil marriage, you can have both, you can have neither. Uh, but uh, the, the, I think we're really opening ourselves up uh, to problems if we, if we continue with the status quo. And it really is, it is a matter of what, what you confess to be the truth, what you believe to be the truth, and uh, that's, that's under attack. That's what political correctness is. It's, uh, it's not about etiquette, it's not about inclusivity, it's about control and domination. And we have to be, as Jesus said, uh, innocent as doves and uh, clever as serpents. So uh, we have to really think and strategize how we're going to move into this brave new world. I appreciate the question. It seems to me, you know, the, the old Marxists the, uh, in, before the worldwide collapse of socialism, they were all about destruction. They were all about destroying the existing system, and they never had an, uh, an idea of what would replace it. You know, they had all these weird theories about you know, man could be an architect in the morning and a farmer in the afternoon and things like that under communism. But the, these these neo-Marxists, the cultural Marxists, they're sort of the same way. They want to destroy institution after institution, whether it's marriage or, or anything else. But they don't really have uh, an idea of what's going to come next. It's sort of like the neocons who want to destroy the Middle East. Uh, but uh, we, they have no idea what's going to happen in Libya or Syria or anywhere else. They just go on to the next bombing, you know, and and then and then walk away from it. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so you know, maybe it's not an accident that all the old, a lot of the prominent old neocons claim to have been Trotskyites in their youth. You know, former Trotskyites. They're sort of the same way of thinking. They're 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 all about destroy, destroying existing institutions. Uh, that have evolved, some some of them over centuries, and then what's left? Uh, chaos and, and a lot of bad things. Question from the audience? <laughs> Lady in the back. Without capitalism, there'd be no art museums. Yeah, That's yeah, you made this point, without capitalism, there would be no art museums. Uh, well, that, that's one of the points that Tyler Cowan made in his book uh, that I referred to earlier uh, on uh, on this. That I think he did a historical study of how, you know, maybe a hundred years ago, uh, almost all major works of art were were financed by benefactors of the artist. But then once you get the National Endowment for the Arts and the and government funding of all this, well, of course it's going to be politicized. And he who takes the king's shilling becomes the king's man. If you want that next year's grant, you have to be politically correct with this year's grant. And it's the same as a, if you get a grant to do economic research, same thing, whether it's creating art or economic uh, research, uh, it, it becomes politicized. Of course it does. Question from the audience. This gentleman here. Would anyone, Anyone a little bit on how the PC culture ignores or confuses positive and negative rights and the libertarian stance on positive and negative rights? Like Anastasia was having a conversation about that last evening. She's she's uh, suffered at the hands of a, of a was it a niece? Uh, a granddaughter who is uh, <coughs> viewing positive rights as positive, happy, good. 
and negative rights as negative, awful, bad. <laughs> so when did this all get so screwed up? When did the two things become conflated and one of them is now subordinate to the other, unfortunately? Uh, well, Paul, well, that's, that's been an issue for many decades, the positive and negative rights. Uh, you know, Hayek wrote about it in the you know, Constitution of Liberty in 1960. Mises wrote about it. Uh, uh, Rothbard wrote about it, about the confusion that some people have about this. Uh, somebody just sent me just yesterday, but uh, it so happens, an article from the Washington Post about this. Uh, and there was an article in the Post claiming that, uh, um, you know, one of the most important rights human beings can have is the right not to have not to have to work, to be able to live without having to work, and so 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 therefore you know we should have a uh, and Robert Reich, the uh, the former Clinton Department of Labor secretary, has a new book out arguing that every 18 year old should be given a stock portfolio, and 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 then everybody should be given an, a a basic income of I don't know how many you know, whatever, how much money he thinks, 20 grand or something like that. And I'm not sure where he says, where he thinks the money will come from. Probably uh, the woman who I call Mother Yellen. Now, maybe she'll, she'll, come, <laughs> she'll come up with the money. But, but that's, that's the uh, positive rights thinking is sort of the, uh, the, the, the fairyland, the you know, wave a magic wand and we all have money. You know, that's, that's, and that's called monet. That's called Federal Reserve Monetary Policy, by the way. And, uh, and, but that's, that's their thinking. That's the Washington Post uh, actually said this uh, two days ago. Somebody <laughs> sent me the, uh, the email. And so, yeah, I don't know what else you can say about it. It's, uh, it's you know, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, speech on the, econo on the freedoms, freedom to have a house, freedom to be free from hunger and all this. It's all about giving people, some, the government giving people something so they have freedom from not having a house or something like that. And so that speech of Roosevelt's uh, was an attack on the whole idea of negative freedom, which is, you know, freedom from being coerced and aggressed upon by the state and, and, its, and its subsidiaries. Add anything? Well, just culturally, this infantilization, I mean, that's what children depend upon receiving from their parents. And at some mm. point, you know, you grow up and you become the parent or you be, you know, you become self-sufficient. But culturally, it's like we've done something to just stunt that normal growing up phase. And now you have, you know, grown-ups, people uh, that, that, that expect other people to provide for them. I mean, I, culturally, I don't know where this happened, but clearly there's been some kind of a, a shift at some point uh, in the culture that's made people kind of expect that. I just read an article, <clears throat> uh, can't remember where it came from, but somebody was commenting on he was spending some time in, a, in one of the most affluent sections of New York City where, you know, part of our ruling elite resides. And he said he was at a restaurant or a Starbucks or something and the, and the children there were just running wild and the parents were doing absolutely nothing, disrupting everything. And, he said, and this person said, it struck me that, well, the parents obviously behaved like that when they were young. And so they, they saw nothing wrong with their children uh, just behaving like wild animals and disrupting everybody in the whole place. And, but he was making the point that, well, these, these are the people, the very affluent, wealthy people who are sort of, sort of the ruling elites. Well, maybe it was the Upper West Side of New York City where Bill Crystal lives or something. Something like that, but it's it's it, your comment reminded me of uh, of reading that the, the infantilization of society has been going on for a while. And by the way, Hans Hoppe's book, Democracy That God the God That Fails, uh, predicted that he said it's inherent in democracy that we create an infantilization of society because of the uh, the high time preference uh, that it encourages, among other things. <clears throat>